in a lineup of really distinguished and wonderful speakers, um, each of whom um, is proving to be at least as interesting as I had hoped, um, it is uh, yet again an honor uh, to be able to introduce um, someone of the stature of Ellen Lupton. Um, so Ellen is the Senior Curator of Contemporary Design at the Smithsonian's Cooper Hewitt in New York. She also runs an MFA graphic design program um, in Baltimore at MICA, and I've known her and her work for um, uh, more decades than you would imagine um, looking at Ellen. Um, so anyway, she is going to speak on the topic of design and framing. Thanks. Hi there. Whoa, okay. It's great to be here. Um, I'm really thrilled to be talking after Christina talked about apprenticeship because I am a teacher and I am in the business of, of showing people how to look and also how to make things that other people will look at. So I'm a graphic designer. I teach graphic design. And graphic design is the art of creating visual communication like books, magazines, websites, interfaces, all of which are visual, but they're never just visual. Um, graphic design always also has a dimension of text and language. And so it's this place where our mental representations and our visual representations collide. So I like to say that visuality isn't just visual. Um, and what I want to do is kind of, I'm not a scientist, I'm a practitioner and an, an apprentice of the eye. And what I want to do is take you through some looking and seeing and to kind of pick up a dimension that maybe hasn't been talked about so much today, which is um, how do we create things that communicate to other people? So we heard about being in the cave and the kind of ritual experience of depicting the animal but we didn't talk about people ever seeing those images and what those images might communicate. Um, and so maybe we'll fill in that link a little bit um, and, and look at some things and see how they work. And, and many of the ideas that I'll discuss are ideas from real scientists that you've heard about today about embodied vision and multisensory uh, perception. And, and we'll just kind of walk through um, doing it doing it together, um, perceiving some things uh, together. So these characters of the alphabet are essential to the modern brain. Um, I'm, I'm certain that our brains have changed in relationship to them. And if you looked inside my brain, you'd see a lot of Helvetica and Garamond and Times New Roman. And it's all there. Um, and, and these are, uh, you know, these, these characters are, are shapes that we perceive um, and that once they're, they're there, we're kind of uh, imprisoned by literacy. And it's rather impossible not to read them and to escape from their grasp, which is omnipresent. Um, and so designers spend a lot of time erasing them or playing with them or essentially using the kind of em embodied, lived, principles of perception uh, to see how much we can uh, kind of uh, defy the image. Um, someone earlier talked about disruptors, uh, these disruptors of the image and how we can still um, communicate. Um, and, and often when we look at a piece of graphic design uh, that grabs us and that is arresting and that captures our interest and our emotion is precisely because it's been disrupted and because it's not crystal clear, and because it forces us, the viewer, to fill in the blanks and to perform this act or this process of seeing in a dynamic way, in a way um, in which we um, can observe the fact that we are filling in the blanks. And I think a lot of our, our pleasure in intriguing visual communication um, occurs when, when we, the viewer, are, are jumping in um, and filling in the blanks um, and experiencing this kind of action of vision. Um, tomorrow you'll hear about um, visual data visualization and the, the many principles um, for, for making data uh, appeal to our perception and catch our eye and to lead us through stories about, about data. 
Um, when, when we look at these two circles overlapping, most of us indeed see two circles overlapping and not three distinct weird, odd shapes, right? So our brain kind of simplifies this image into two things. Um, and that's the principle behind things like the Venn diagram, right, which takes that kind of universal capacity of the brain to simplify that image and turns it into something that communicates data and relationships, right? That we are able and with our brain to perceive not only three complete whole circles, but also the places of their overlap, right? And this simultaneity is an extremely expressive and powerful and communicating a great deal of logical stuff, right? Just through um, three circles that overlap. And this can become a technique of, of narrative and communication um, that has a great deal of, of power. This really describes most of us in the room, perhaps, but especially Anyone who's a graphic designer <laughs> feels that way. Um, and then designers play these games with, with simultaneous form uh, for visual effect, for emotional effect, this beautiful poster where we're able to see many things at once collapsed onto a single surface. And, and our eye has no trouble pulling the parts away from each other and, and putting them back together. And I think there's a great deal of a visual pleasure in that process. Um, and here it's done with the alphabet. Um, and we have this incredible uh, durability, right? The alphabet is, an, is a very durable form um, that allows us to uh, do a lot of bad things to it. And we still uh, can read it, and sometimes it's done in order to find overlaps and meaning and content, um, these simultaneities of verbal form. Um, earlier, we, we, we heard about the, the will to close a shape, right, that, that Harold talked about. When, when you close a shape, it becomes an object. Um, and we do this even when nobody took their Sharpie and did it for us. Our brain does it. So, so we look at this circle with the gap, and we all want to close it and see it as a whole thing. Um, and designers do this, and they introduce gaps into stuff, and they build letters out of pieces that are, 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 are split up in space, but our, but our eye puts them together. And one of the beauties of something like this to me is also that it implies a narrative, that it implies motion and change. Um, and a, and a, th a theme throughout my talk today will really be about stories and about how through simple graphics um, we tell stories. Um, this is a, a beautiful typographic design by Philippe Appelwa. Um, and here you see that same design literally narrated and the, the potential for movement that's in the static graphic uh, here becomes something that's really moving and then coming back together, resolving itself into those irrevocable symbols of the alphabet that will not let us go, <laughs> ever. <laughs> um, and there's another beautiful poster by Philippe, um, and, and here he split apart letters across the shape of the grid, and we learned today that the grid is universal, that the human mind, the first thing an infant can see is the vertical and the horizontal, and of course graphic designers play with this. Um, and so here you see these wonderful alphabetic forms split across the grid, but also these white diagonals that cut through the image, and they also are this kind of principle of continuation, right? This, this line that our eye creates. Um, and really the pleasure in looking at this is the pleasure of doing that work, of, of, and of watching your own brain do the work, right? Work that we do every day. This dumbfoundingly beautiful piece of typography by, by Carol Martins um, is these overlapping numerals created out of hundreds of rectangles organized on a grid, none of them touching in the proper way, and we, we put it together, we kind of um, connect, right, the pattern implicit in those numerals um, to find them all on this one space together. Um, and I find it totally beautiful. Um, I want to show you a parallel for that that's not from the world of vision, but from the world of music. 
And it's from this wonderful book by Michael Haberkamp called Synesthetic Design about multisensory design, which I highly recommend to all of you, <laughs> which really um, applies these ideas of gestalt continuation and pattern continuation um, to other senses beyond vision. Um, so, so here's one from his book, and I'll play you a little clip so you can hear it. And what it is is a flute solo. So it's a single instrument, but the instrument simulates the playing of two instruments simultaneously. So just like those numerals, zero, two, and three, occupying a single surface of printed paper, what you're going to hear is two sound patterns occupying the same space. Um, and in the clip, first you'll hear each segment by itself, and then you'll hear the whole piece put together. And as it comes to the end is really where it becomes the most beautiful. So I, I ask you to, to concentrate and, and to listen to really what is kind of a miracle to me, because what it sounds like is two instruments, right? But it's really a single instrument. And it's the fact of our ability to recognize these two patterns, right? These two stories, these two narratives that have an arc that we're anticipating, right? That we miraculously put it together um, and create a symphony of sorts out of a single voice. So please listen. Amazing. Um, so I find that, that truly, truly magnificent. Um, I was fascinated by the discussion of, of faces and face recognition and what we remember and what we forget. I think I forget much more than I remember. Um, we talked about the exploring the valley of the uncanny um, and the idea of the kind of our, our, our sensitivity to seeing faces that are no longer real. Um, where, where do we become horrified and shocked um, when someone becomes a mannequin? Um, the governor of Texas comes to mind. Um, I teach in an art school, so I, I see a lot of a beautiful art. I also see a lot of um, bored, affluent teenagers. Um, and I was walking down the hall one day and saw this wonderful painting, which is life-size, and I was just sort of taken with it. And of course, I wanted to take a picture, which I did. And immediately, my, my iPhone recognized all these people as real. <laughs> and you know, so I, so I feel like when we're looking at images, they aren't just images. They are, they are looking at us. We are communicating with them. Um, and designers do this um, a lot. Um, and often, designers play with that distance between how, you know, between er erasing the face, right, making it go away, um, creating emotional tension and surprise um, through um, distortion and, and erasure. And that's what really gives these images their, their potency, right, is, is the missing face. Um, this is from a wonderful book about Shakespeare that my, my sister, who's a Shakespeare scholar, brought to my attention. And the book uh, points out the prevalence of the word I uh, in Shakespeare and the fact that the bard referred to eyes far more than he referred to ears. Um, and that for him, the faculty of looking was as important as the faculty of talking. And that for actors on the stage, um, the eye contact was not just a way to express the actor's inward emotion, but actually to induce action and new states of being in other people, right? So that the, the looking at people and making eye contact is a communication intended to change people's 
other people, right? And this is what design is always trying to do. Design is not simply a static representation of my inner thoughts or my inner desires. It is an attempt to create change in the world, to get people to read something, buy something, do something, run to the nearest exit, go take a piss in the ladies' room, whatever it might be. Design <laughs> is this communication between the objects that we make and beings, right? Anyway, and the eyes are, are a way that we do that, and often designers will, will emphasize or, or dramatize eyes and an image in order to create this emotional connection with the viewer, right? It's an exchange, a communication with the viewer. Or erasing the eyes, replacing them um, with Helvetica. Why not, right? And that abstraction, um, that fetish of the eye is, is one of the ways that we create an emotional connection um, with our audience, right? Who we can't speak to directly, we speak to them through our work. I want to talk about stories. Um, stories are very important to me. Um, stories are part of what design does. I think Aristotle is still right. I like his definition the best, that a story is a whole action of a certain magnitude, right? It's something that begins and ends, it climaxes, it has a sense of completion, and you know that it happened, right? Um, and we do this visually. Um, we make images that try to tell stories in a single frame. This is a World War II poster that tells quite an elaborate story through one image. Um, and then during World War II, as a, a common trope, a common piece of propaganda information was to tell people not to talk too much because spies were everywhere. The Germans were just around the corner. Um, a, a common expression was loose lips sink ships. And there are many propaganda posters um, from the early 40s that, that represent this. And so here you can see this entire story told in vivid narrative detail. You have the ship, you have the, the, the guys on the lifeboat, you have the burning, the explosion, you have, you have it all there. Um, and it's sort of taking a story at this moment of climax and representing it. And you might think it's rather well done until you see this. <laughs> Same year, right? Uh, and so often as designers, we try to eliminate all this shit, right? And just bring it right down, right down there. And so, right, so a story has a beginning, it, it picks up, it gets more exciting, it has a, it has a climax like a sex act, and then it resolves, and that's the part where, you know, in old movies they would smoke a cigarette, now we just check our iPhones, <laughs> right? And you need that whole arc, right, to know that it really happened, and really it's like many little dramas, right? Every sentence is a kind of drama. Um, there's a beautiful diagram um, by Kurt Vonnegut um, describing his way that he believed that narrative worked, um, and that every narrative is actually a graph between ecstasy and misery. And we can chart any given story as a kind of dipping in and out of ecstasy and misery. So this is like the archetypal story of the little girl fell in the well, right? And so when she falls in the well, this is misery and this is a very bad thing. And then the whole town gets together and they save her, right? And it goes back up towards something better. And it's better than it was, right? Because everybody came together and they're, they're not just back to normal life, but to life that's been enhanced by their communal experience, right? They killed the bear, they saved the girl, they're, they're a more organized society. Um, unfortunately, real life is like this. And it just sort of hovers somewhere in the middle and never gets much ecstasy or misery. And that's why we have stories, right? Because stories give us a better bump, right? Um, and uh, design kind of, kind of helps us uh, tell stories. Um, I like this definition of narrativizing by Johanna Drucker, where she talks about creating stories as something that happens 
from you, right? It isn't just that the story is on the page, but that, that we kind of make it happen, and that's this element um, of experience, right? That a story is something we experience. Um, in design now, we talk a lot about experience design. Um, this is a great diagram from the book, The Experience Economy, which is all about um, how we've abandoned old-fashioned products for things like Starbucks coffee, where what you're purchasing is not just the coffee, but a whole narrative, a whole drama um, that involves the moment you enter the store to your period of waiting for your beverage and the smell and the sound and the, the CD track and all that kind of stuff. And if you compare your experience at a place like McDonald's where you're simply handed a ticket with a number on it and you go stand, you don't know where you're supposed to stand, right? Everybody's like clustered uh, versus the Starbucks experience, which is all designed um, to be a drama of a different sort, right, that's more personal. And then there's things like this, the, the Super Wawa store, which is a big convenience store chain on the East Coast, fantastic. Um, and, and the sort of theme of their experience is, is self-service and the kind of the hero's journey um, of doing it yourself. And so there's, instead of talking to a barista at all, there's a touch screen, and you can order your entire coffee, um, everything about it, uh, without actually talking to anybody, and then it spits out a little ticket that you take to the cash register. And it's really a pretty great experience. <laughs> I gotta tell you, and this is Becky, she's the best barista in South Jersey, um, and she loves it too, because she doesn't have to listen to your shit. <laughs> now, half calf, semi, blah, 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 with no foam, and it's just like, it's all on a piece of paper, she makes it and she never has to talk to you. Um, and designers, this is part of what we do now, and Aaron Marcus might talk about it tomorrow, about this whole new world of service design and experience design, which is really cool. And, and every experience can be designed. Uh, you may have had an experience with caulk. Um, caulk is a very complex product that most of us don't use very much. Um, it involves a gun, which makes it fun, but it's a whole other element. And, and the company IDEO, which has headquarters nearby, um, was asked to redesign the caulk experience and to rethink this complex of stuff and say, how could people have a better and more satisfying experience with caulk? And this is what they came up with, caulk singles. Right, and it's really for your casual caulker, your weekend one night stand caulker. And if you think about it, you know, most of us use that caulk once and it goes back in the garage in the gun where it dries up. And then next time you need it, you have to buy it anyway. And so this product is kind of amazing because it tells a story. Everything about the product is narrating this story, right? This thing that happens over time, the shape, like a teardrop, like a Google map pin. Um, the instructions, right? Squeeze, tear, use, toss, right? One, two, three, beginning, middle, end, a whole action of a certain magnitude <laughs> with your caulk, right? Um, so we've been talking about embodied cognition, which I think is fantastic, and the idea of vision um, being uh, connected to your body, to your experience of the world. Um, and you guys all know the science, I don't have to bother you with that. Um, but let's, let's go through some stories about it, right? So that we don't just think with our eyes, we think with our ass, okay? So this is a, um, a planter in a lovely little regional airport on the East Coast. Um, and when I, when I see a planter like this, a situation like this, I immediately well, I think of a story, and I think that the story started like this. <laughs> and someone had a lovely idea to put live plants in the airport, in a planter exactly the height of a chair, <laughs> okay? Um, and what happens when things like this occur is usually a graphic designer is hired to fix it. Um, and a very nice little sign was put on the planter and it's sort of in wedding script. It says, please keep off. 
Uh, but of course, people still sat on the planter, so they had to put another sign on there, a little bigger and higher. Maybe people will see it this time. And I'm certain that the next time I go to Manchester, Vermont, um, the sign will be even better. The people will still sit on the planter. Right, so in psychology, we call this an affordance, and it's part of this whole area of embodied uh, perception and how objects, the landscape of objects, invites us to act, right, with our body. Um, and, and not just people, but, but animals, uh, too. I, I'm a good house, housewife, uh, but like most of you, I have good days and bad days. And on a good day, my little living area looks like this. Um, and on a bad day, I you know, forgot to fold the blanket and it doesn't look so great. Um, but what I discovered is that when I leave the blanket like that, something amazing happens. <laughs> and it's just <laughs> really great. And I have to ask myself, like, is it better to have my beautiful dogs on the messy blanket, right? And so, so, so for them, the blanket is an invitation um, to relax, right, and to, to cuddle up. And, and interface design is like this too, where things like buttons and things that look three-dimensional invite action. Um, so this is the old Mac OS in the olden days a year ago where everything looked like a jelly bean. And now this is iOS 7, which is flat, right? But there's still like a little bit of depth to it and a little bit of transparency that suggests a kind of uh, action. So I have a little movie I'm going to show you um, that, that shows you the narrative arc that takes place when you throw away a folder from your desktop on an Apple computer. And I'm going to show it once in real time, and then I'm going to slow it down for you so that you can enjoy the incredible subtlety and the range of animation techniques and the sound, which again is like a symphony at the end, the crunching sound when your file finally disappears into the void of the trash can. Um, so please enjoy this short film. How many signals? <laughs> right? And of course, that is all a fiction. You haven't moved anything anywhere. You've just changed the address on those files. Like nothing has actually moved. It is all a narrative fiction to give you the sense that you have erased your files, which you haven't done either. You've done nothing, um, right? OK. So, so I'm moving towards the end here, and I can see my, my beautiful clock here uh, ticking. I'm going to just talk briefly this idea of narrativizing, which Johanna has so beautifully created a verb for us about turning narrative into something you do. So how do we do this to a still image? I think I'm going to run out of time for that, but OK. So, so I want you to think, I want you to shut your eyes. And I want you to think about a guy running past you in a purple sweatsuit, OK? Everybody has him. You've seen him. Which way was he running? OK. <laughs> Lots of confusion here. Uh, most, most English speakers will have him running in the direction of text, right? Because that's your brain on typography, and that's the, the tyranny of the alphabet um, will make that guy run in a certain direction. And, and designers can use this uh, to create images that are, that are read in time, even though they're um, still images. Um, this is from an experiment where, where people were from different language groups were told to arrange the banana images in an order. And depending on your language group, people put it in a different order because language actually determines a lot of how, how we see, right? So, so here's a wonderful uh, image by, by Christoph Niemann. Um, and we read the story of this 
we read the image from left to right. We read the image from top to bottom, right? We have an experience of this. The humor of it unfolds in time, even though it's a single image. We read it from top to bottom. Right. Uh, that, la that last one is an example of, of misdirection, which is my, my favorite technique in humor and suspense and storytelling. And that basically um, any story, right, it, it's mo it has an arc, it has a certain direction. It becomes satisfying to us when it goes the wrong way, when the, when the story ends in a way we didn't expect, right? And that's when we get humor and suspense and other, other forms of satisfying surprise um, happen when it, when it goes the wrong way. Um, so, so I love the competition every week in The New Yorker where they have a funny uh, cartoon, right? And you're supposed to come up with, with a line that makes it whole and it's like, the picture is funny. But it's not a joke. It's not satisfying, right? It's not finished um, until someone puts the right uh, caption with it. <laughs> and what makes this funny is that the caption is asking us to look at the wrong part of the picture, right? The part of the picture that's not actually funny. And that, so that the week that this one won the prize, there was a couple of runner-ups, including this one, <laughs> which is the same joke. Right, it's just pointing to a different part of the picture. Um, so, so this is a great definition of humor, that it's like a train wreck, right? That the train is going in a certain direction, but suddenly it, it jumps the rail, right? And that's the punchline, right? There's a violence to that word punchline uh, because it took us somewhere unexpected, right? Again, Christoph Neiman. So, so the rule of three in, in comedy is that when you have a series, right, the series is going along in a certain way. It's a pattern, like in the flute solo, right, a pattern that we recognize. And what makes it funny is that the last thing in the series is wrong. It's incongruous. It changes our, our frame of perception. It gives us an image that's unexpected, right, a mental image. Um, so, for example, this, this book cover for this wonderful book published right, a, right nearby at McSweeney's Press. Um, funny. Funnier. And it's a pattern, and we all expect what the third thing in the pattern will be, and it's not what you expected, and that's where the humor um, comes. So I know I used up a little extra time, but does anyone... <laughs> yes, Johanna? I'll ask a question. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, all right. You need the mic? All right. So one of the things that's very striking um, in the images that you produced, uh, that you presented, as well as in the narrative segments, um, is the degrees of incompletion. Mm -hmm. Right, so, so there are many kinds of incomplete things, and yet they are not the same kind of incompletion in each case. And so one of the things I was thinking about as you were talking is a kind of difference I would see between an invitation and a provocation in incompleteness. And that, you know, when we think about the affordances of, of Gibson saying, you know, a crook in the tree is an invitation to, to a nest. And it almost seems to me like invitation is a kind of opening for that which is most um, predictable or most likely to happen. And a provocation is that which sort of, you know, is a, an opportunity for that which is a kind of well, possibility space or surprise um, uh, that, that might happen. And, it, you know, it's just where is that structure distinguished? I, I don't know if you would agree with this or not, but it was just striking to, to think about different kinds of incompleteness in the, and, and how, they, how they engage the viewer and reader um, towards different kinds of experience. Yeah, that's definitely a theme in, in what I was looking at. Um, and, it, and it has to do also with this theme of pattern, right, and that we expect a story to have a certain arc. When we hear a song, it has a logic to it, so we're able to anticipate and predict how it's going to go. Um, and a lot of this whole area of embodied perception, embodied cognition, has to do with our ability to predict what's going to happen, right? And that, that I know a chair has four legs, even if I can't see them all. And that creates a stable world that we can all 
um, navigate a world in which we actually see very little of it, but through our experience, we have a pretty reliable uh, model of how things work. Um, but what happens, I think, with more artistic expression, whether it's a graphic image of a face with no eyes or whether it's a joke, is that the pattern is broken, right? And so in breaking the pattern and presenting you with a pattern where you think you know how it's gonna go and it goes somewhere else, I think that's where we create art. And I don't mean art with a capital A, but I mean an aesthetic experience, right? And, and finding the women's room is not an aesthetic experience. We want that to be predictable. and We want design signals to safely carry us there, and we don't really want surprises. And much of design, much of the work that we do as designers, is about creating that predictable world for you all to inhabit. Um, but sometimes we also want to create art and create something that will surprise you, um, whether it's through base humor or through something more poetical. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much.